So first of all, uh, uh, to my colleague, uh, Calvin, uh, thank you for uh, facilitating this visit. Uh, Paul, it's great to see you here, my colleague Paul Lane, your worship. Uh, Tom and I have been friends for a very long time, and uh, I wasn't in politics uh, very long uh, when Tom and I had a piece of business uh, that we had to do together, but Tom and I first met uh, through the Federation of Municipalities because I was Deputy Mayor of Bjorn and Tom was Mayor of Arnold's Cove, and that's when we started our devilment back a long time ago. It's getting to be a long time ago now. And of course, to the executive of the chamber and ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it's my great pleasure to be here. Yes, Tom and I uh, uh, were involved in municipal government, but I hadn't been in government very long when we heard that the Arnold's Cove plant was in some difficulty. And uh, Herb Brett, I'm sure who you all know, Herb was a great friend of ours as well. And uh, Herb made some uh, representations to me. And we got together ourselves and uh, representation from the, uh, uh, from the municipality here. And we worked really hard uh, to make sure that uh, ice water plant had a future. It wasn't ice water back then. And uh, it was our very first budget. That, those were early days, early days in government, and we were doing our very first budget, and it's appropriate that I talk to you about budget tonight, especially given the poll today. <laughs> and, uh, but we had a mess on our hands, let me tell you, when we came in 2003, and trying to do that budget for 2004, 2005 was an extremely difficult piece of work. And we knew that uh, Henry Des Moines was leaving here. And we knew that he was trying to create some kind of a legacy through Mr. Wareham and through the people in this community to keep that fish plant going. And we knew that Mr. Wareham was prepared to put everything he had on the table to keep the plant going. But there was a question of quotas. And the quotas needed to be sold and the price was three and a half million dollars. And when you think about it, and I think about it now, how much better times are now, that when you talk about three and a half million dollars now, as a government, it's still a significant amount of money. It's a very significant amount of money. But not as significant as it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, that was a huge amount of money in a budget time when we had nothing. And, uh, and you know, the province was virtually bankrupt. And we were having to make horrible decisions about healthcare services, about education, about cancer drugs, about infrastructure and about roads and so on. And in the middle of it all, there's this question about whether or not we're gonna provide three and a half million dollars to this new company to buy the quotas and lease the quotas to the company so that plant could remain operational and, and there be an economic base to drive this community. And, and one Saturday morning, uh, Herb was in St. John's on some business and the doorbell rang and I went down and then he came for a cup of coffee and we sat around my kitchen table and we, we talked about how we could advance that proposal within government. And I remember saying to him, yeah, I'm prepared to do it, but you need to go back to Arnold's Cove and you gotta to talk to Tom and the council there because they gotta put something on the table as well. Because I know if I go and it's just an ask and, and, and the proponent of the business is in, but I don't have anything from the community, I'm not likely to get a good hearing. Now let me tell you, 10 years ago, thinking outside the box uh, like that in terms of getting a municipality to respond uh, was extremely unusual. And I don't know of any other circumstance where that happened. So Herb came back, met up with Tom. Tom and I had three or four uh, conversations. The municipality just stepped up to the plate and it took a lot of courage and a lot of vision and a lot of hope 
uh, to come forward and said, yeah, we'll drive a stake in too. We'll put a stake in the ground here because we believe in our community and we believe in our future. And so with all of that behind us, we were able to go to cabinet with the proposal and get it approved. And it was a great day, I think, for the people of Ireland's Cove, but it was a great day for the province too. And this gives me so much pleasure. You know, in the fishery, you're, n you're never without challenges. And it's never been without challenges, not in the 500 years we've been here. Uh, but you know, we're still going strong 10 years later. And you know, that's a real testimony to, to, to your mayor, Tom Osborne, I, I gotta say, and to your council at the time, they were absolutely marvelous and I was glad to be a small part of it. So, the, so this year, budgets are never fun. Let me tell you, they never are. And sometimes it's more challenging when you have money uh, than when you don't. And uh, this year we had a difficult challenge. You know, there's only a half million of us. Over 30% of our revenue comes from oil. There's a lot of volatility in oil. And everybody talks about, you know, oh, they didn't forecast the price very well. And there's not many people in the world who do because you don't have control over any of the circumstances that dictate what the price of oil is going to be. You know, we go to the, to the best uh, expertise that we can find, people who understand conditions all around the world, under, understand demand, understand supply, know about... Uh, uh, tensions in the world and, and, and what's likely going to happen on a geopolitical basis and so on and they'll give us a forecast and we'll go to four or five of those agencies and they'll give us a range uh, of prices but you know you're always running the risk because anything could happen you know if a war breaks out in the Middle East you know or she'll go this way you know, a great discovery of shale gas in the United States, she can go that way. And it can happen very quickly. So, you know, the, the challenge for us in government all the time is, is what's the right number to put in the budget. And we've been using the same methodology for 10 years, exactly the same methodology. And for the last number of years, we've had great big, def great big surpluses and people are saying, you're doing it on purpose, you know, you're fudging the numbers. No, we use the methodology and you put in what you think is a safe number. But if something happens in the world to drive the price of oil, then you get a windfall profit, windfall profit. And that's not a bad thing. We've been able, in part, because of those windfalls we've had over the last number of years, in part, we've been able to pay down a significant, help pay down a significant part of our debt because you take that money at the end of the year that you didn't expect to have and you put it on the debt. And it's important we get our debt down. But if it goes the other way, then you don't have the revenues that you thought you were gonna to have to run the place and you're gonna end up driving your debt up at the end of the day because you've had a deficit. And most people don't understand how the budget uh, works and it's a complicated piece of work and, and it, it's hard to find a way to explain it simply to people without boring them to death. But you know, our current budget, which the budget we pass in the House of Assembly every year, in a nutshell, is the money we need to run the province. It's not any different than your household. You know, it's not the money to buy, to, to build the schools and, and, and to build the hospitals and so on. That's capital, that's over in another fund. But the money you need to run the hospital, the money you need to hire the teachers and the nurses and the doctors and buy the drugs and, and pave the roads and all of that kind of stuff, that's in the budget every year. So, you know, if you run out of money, you know, you still got to keep your schools going. You still got to keep the hospitals going and so on. So you got to try and keep that as balanced as you can because if you haven't forecasted properly, then you're going to run out of money and then you got to start borrowing or running up debt to keep things going. So it's trying to find that measurement all the time and it's very, very volatile, which is one of the reasons why we're trying hard to develop our renewables. Not only because there's great wealth in our, in our non-renewables, but there's less volatility. It's much more predictable 
And once we get things like Muskrat and hopefully Gull Island eventually and all the massive wind and tidal resources we have in this province developed, then we'll have a very sustainable foundation to whatever else we do. And we still got, we hope, lots of oil. We haven't touched our gas yet. And there's much more to come. The future is so bright uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's a great place to live. It's a great place to be today. The difference in the last 10 years is nothing short of incredible. Nothing short of incredible. We make more money in this province now than we've ever done in our history. Wages are higher. People have more disposable income than any other time in our history. There are more people working in Newfoundland and Labrador now than ever before in our history. People are paying less taxes in Newfoundland and Labrador than ever before, and the lowest in Atlantic Canada. Our students have the least cost education in the country. We spend more on health care per capita than any other jurisdiction in the country. There is more investment in Newfoundland and Labrador per capita this year than anywhere else in the country. It is absolutely amazing. 80% of our people are shielded from personal income tax. 20% of the people who work in this province pay 70% of the taxes. So 80% of the people, which tend to be people on the margins, they're there, if you're making less than $40,000 a year as a family or you're a senior citizen, you're shielded. And we've worked hard at doing that. There's been half a billion dollars given in tax cuts in the last 10 years to individuals and community. We pay our public service well. There's been half a billion dollars added annually to our bottom line from the last pay increases. And of course, we're in negotiations again now. So by every measurement, I was reading earlier this week in a, in a note that I had, or last week, the days run into one another, uh, about the investment that's stacked up to happen in this province. And there's nowhere else in the country that can compare. And right now we have Long Harbor going, and I know that that's an important uh, project to the people in this area. I mean, Bull Arm is, is blocked uh, with what's happening in Hebron. Uh, we've got Muskrat Falls on the go, and now we're talking to Husky about their next piece of work that they're doing on White Rose, and we'll negotiate a benefits agreement for that, and that's going to mean, you know, that we've even probably got to broaden uh, our ability. Uh, to do these infrastructure pieces, these work pieces, even beyond the yards that are now operational here in the province, particularly Bull Arm and, uh, and Marystown. And so you'll likely see some work now happening in Argentia, and we hope the day will come soon when we'll start to do work because of our, our exploration program on the West Coast that you'll start to see some of that work come to uh, Stephenville as well. And our seismic work off Labrador that we've just completed indicates that what we've seen so far in this province in terms of oil and gas is the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg is some of the most exciting seismic work uh, that uh, the people who study this stuff tell me that they have ever seen. Uh, one of the experts who looked at the seismic commented that in 30 years of looking at at this kind of uh, data. It's the most interesting, it's the most exciting he's ever seen. So, you know, big challenges before the government. Again, because we're maturing in this industry and so on now, so we need to talk about how do we take that data then? How do we use these new ventures we're getting into and these new developments we're getting in to, to bring out even more benefits for the people of the province? Because that has been our mantra since 2003, and this government will never deviate from that. That's, that is why we're here. Despite uh, what people sometimes think in terms of what we do, we never forget who we work for. We never forget who hired us. We do not. 
and we don't forget who we work for. And this budget has been a particularly difficult one because there are only half a million of us. And we need to get, we're still dragging around $8 billion worth of debt. And while we've needed to invest heavily in infrastructure over the last eight years, and we all know why we needed to do that, you know, we need to scale back our spending if we're going to keep taxes low, if we're not going to overburden uh, the people uh, of the province, because it has to be paid for. You know, you, if we keep jacking up the debt, you still lose money from your current account because you, you, nobody gives you money for free. So you have to pay the servicing charges and so much on that. And because we paid down $4 billion of, of debt over the last 10 years, eight years, we have freed up over $400 million a year that we can spend in programming year over year over year because we don't have to service that $4 billion debt anymore. It's gone. And we need to get it down because $8 billion is too much for this small uh, population. And we need to do things efficiently and effectively. You know, there was a great uh, a brouhaha over uh, the ABE program. And, you know, people talk about cuts to education. Well, the ABE program hasn't been cut. We're going to deliver it a different way. Right now, this year, there's over 2,000 students involved in the ABE program. 1,200 of them take their courses in the private sector. They take them through the private colleges or the not-for-profits. The other 800 do it in the College of the North Atlantic. The cost of ABE in Atlantic in the Maritimes, so the other three Maritime provinces, most expensive one is $2,300 per person per year. In the private sector, in the not-for-profits here, we get the program for over just over 4,000. In the colleges, just over five. And they have a 40% success rate with their students. In the College of the North Atlantic, the cost is 9500 per person per year. And we only have a 30% pass rate. And sometimes we have as few, in one class, we had one instructor, one person. Sometimes four and an instructor. And so we needed to think about how we were going to deliver that program more effectively. People need the program. There's no question about that. And we have no intention of denying people ABE if that's what they want to have. But we can deliver it more cheaply, more effectively, more successfully in the private sector. And that's been a difficult message to try and communicate to people with all of the chatter that goes on. You know, there's such a noise about it all. And we need to free up infrastructure within the college because we've been paying a lot of attention to what the labor demand is. So, you know, what's Husky going to need? What's Valet going to need? What does Hebron need? What does Muskrat need? They need welders and electricians and people who do instrumentation and all of these kinds of things. So we can't have our college tied up like a classroom tied up with four people in a, I hate saying this, but I'm going to say it, hairdressing, when we got 40 people waiting to do electrical. We've got to respond. We've got a 70,000 job deficit coming here in the next 10 years. 70,000 jobs available to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. We need to make sure that people are ready to avail of those opportunities. And God knows we all need our hairdressers. Me, most days, more than most. But, you know, if there's a better way for us to deliver that program, to the people who need it because there are fewer of them and there are other opportunities that can be taken advantage of, then we need to get our college working at its optimum level. And it can't be about what the instructors there can teach. It has to be about what the students who are coming in, young men and women who are coming out of ABE programs, coming out of our schools, our high school, what do they need? 
so that they're properly trained and able to take advantage of the opportunities that we've worked so hard to make available to the people of the province. Everything we've done in the last 10 years, all the fights and the rackets and carry-ons we've had over the last 10 years has been about maximizing our natural resources to the benefit of the people of the province. So there are thousands and thousands of jobs available to our young people, but that's no good if they're not trained. You know, if we got a thousand electricians required, then a hairdresser is not going to take the job. We got to get our people trained up for these jobs, which means we have to maximize the resources that we have here in the province. And sometimes it will work better in the, in the private sector, and sometimes it works better for government to be doing it. So, you know, it's these kinds of, uh, of situations and let me tell you something. When you ever come to a place where you gotta lay people off, and I, and I talk about it all the time because you, you have a wonderful public service. It takes an exceptional person to work in the public ser service because you work hard your work is rarely acknowledged, <laughs> even more rarely honored, and, and you do that without, you work with passion, you, you give it everything you have. You have to put up with people like me who come in and say, oh, I know you've put your heart and soul into that for the last five years, but we're not doing that anymore that way. Now we're doing this way. And you know something? They lay it down, and with the same passion and commitment, they come this new way. So we have, a, we have a wonderful public service. I'm, when I go across this country, I can tell you there's no other premier better prepared or better supported than I am. And the work of our public service is head and shoulders over most, and there's none that are better. And so when you got to say to the public service, you know, we got to cut back, we got to do things differently, we're going to have to, to rearrange these things because if we're going to keep our commitment to the people of the province to do things effectively and to do the best things in their interest that we have to do this. So we got to say goodbye to 900 of you. It is extremely difficult. And people don't like it. People don't like it either. And we saw that very clearly this morning. People don't like it. And I understand that. There's nothing about that that's nice or good or makes you feel warm and cozy but necessary, absolutely necessary. That's why we don't have an election every time a poll comes in. You have an election every four years because you have to have the, the ability yeah, to, to make difficult decisions. It's like being a parent. It really is in lots of ways, and, and I don't mean that to sound patronizing at all. But you know, I remember going to bed some nights and knowing that my kids didn't like me very much. And, but it was the right thing to do. I had a responsibility to do something and I did it. And it was difficult. And I had to suffer through uh, uh, the, uh, the wrath until, you know, there was a better understanding of why it was all necessary. So. <laughs> You know, while it is difficult, you know, to be through what we've, we've had to go through and see some of the fallout of that, like I believe so passionately in this place. And as I said, by every measurement, every measurement, we are all doing so well. And the future is so bright. But we're at a pivotal time, a transitional time. We need to be very careful now to get this right so that the prosperity that we see today is continued. You know, Nelcor is a great company and, and it took a lot of effort on my part to convince Nelcor that they had to take over Bull Arm. Because as a government, you know, we just didn't even have the expertise to market that yard uh, worldwide to understand the kind of investments that needed to be made there to make it successful. 
and you know that's that's happening day over day after day and you see it and that yard will continue to bring prosperity to this area of the province for a very long time to come and I'm really happy about that. So I'm happy to come here and talk to you and I'm going to stay as long as I can and hopefully after dinner we'll have a have a chance to, to mingle. So it's nice to be back. I always feel like I'm amongst friends here. Thank you so much for having me.